I am going to talk about the family law court. Uh, in, in my last presentation, I started to bear on the issue of acknowledging, knowing and acknowledging that divorce may be the path forward and that couples sometimes have to recognize that a death has taken place, the death of the vitality of their coupledom and that they can, they can live uh, with the aftermath of being in a dead relationship or they can find the courage to leave. I came up with a metaphor several years ago and I hadn't thought of it until I was getting ready again to uh, make this talk today. But the metaphor is what a, what a challenge it is for any of us to get married. We're taught it should be easy and gracious and we should find somebody wonderfully loving and we'll ride off into the sunset together. But it's not like that at all. It's a commitment to do gardening. And if you're going to marry somebody, it's like both of you blindfold yourselves, you reach your hands into a container and you pull out a seed. You grope with your fingers to find a seed you'll both feel feels like a reasonable seed. You take it out and you put it in the ground. Now, in order for the seed to blossom and grow, it needs a lot, a lot of work, particularly in the beginning. And then later on, it continues to need work. It has to be pruned and watered and fed and fertilized. And the soil has to be tilled. It's an ongoing responsibility. You have to take care of it. But there is an additional problem. You don't know when you pull the seed out, because you're not experts on seeds, whether this is a seed of a sequoia tree. So if you put it in the ground, it might last for a thousand years if you take care of it. Or if it's a seed for something that has a plant that has a very short lifespan, it just grows, blossoms, and dies. And no matter how well you take care of it, it's going to die. And it has nothing to do with your neglect or or not being a responsive gardener for that particular plant. So that is the crapshoot we get involved in if we decide to couple with somebody. As I said last time, uh, a large portion of the people who decide to marry will wind up, if not actually getting a divorce, but probably being somebody who would profit from the courage to get a divorce. I would set the figure at somewhere between 60 to 65% of all marriages that are going to be made this, this year in California will wind up uh, either in living deadness or in active divorce. And that's just something like there are certain days of rain every year. They're getting fewer, unfortunately, <laughs> but there are rainy seasons and then sunny seasons. It's a fact. It's just not anybody's fault. It's not anybody's responsibility. That is just what is going to happen, no matter how well you take care of that plant that was handed to you. It will certainly die if you don't take care of it, but some, some of the plants that get planted are going to die anyhow. Uh, it's hard for people to come apart. The court in some ways, and now I can start talking about the court, has moved beyond where lots of people are. The court in California, at least, and I'm not familiar with the court system in any other state, so whenever I'm talking, I'm talking about what I know about the state of California. This is a no-fault state. Nobody has to, in order to get a divorce, no one has to go to court and prove that the partner was an awful human being because it used to be that way, and that was the only justification. I remember, I do know some things about the history of law. In the state of New York, well into the 1930s, the only grounds for divorce was infidelity. And a person had to have proof that the partner was being unfaithful. And then the unfaithful partner was the evil one and the guilty one. And the one who was not unfaithful could then get a divorce from the person who had been unfaithful. We have a no-fault state in California, and I think the majority of states of the union now are no-fault states. In California, there's only one grounds for divorce, and the legal language is the couple has irreconcilable differences. 
I like that comment, actually. That's a nice concept, irreconcilable difference. They're, they're living together. It's bad between the two of them. They have serious differences. They can't figure out any ways to reconcile those differences. They can't convince each other. They can't come to the right kinds of agreements. And maybe what they need to do is to stop bickering, stop fighting, stop hurting each other, stop upsetting children and their children, and just accept the fact that it's time to get a divorce. And the court will grant them a divorce on that single ground. There are differences they've not been able to reconcile with each other. I find that a great kindness and a great thoughtfulness, actually. That does not stop the people who are moving towards getting a divorce from being in the classic somebody is right, somebody is wrong dilemma. We are taught uh, in almost every religious orientation and if things that have to do with what should be the morals of the country. We are taught that marriages are to be treated as sacred uh, things and that uh, nobody, they should last for a lifetime and nobody who's a reasonable person and who shows up and does what is required to make a marriage, they shouldn't get into great pain and trouble and they shouldn't be going and seeking for divorces. If somebody is getting a divorce in that marriage, at least one, if not both of the people are engaged in some kind of rotten, unconscionable behavior and deserves to be stigmatized and punished for having failed to uphold the moral and aspirational standards of the culture. This unfortunately drives a great deal of bad behavior in the court system. Whoop. Oh, that's my wife. I think I have to answer. Hello? Yeah. No, I'm giving my lecture right now. Oh, I forgot. It's Friday. Yeah. Right, never mind. I've just got a lot of heavy packages, but I'll do, I'll just do a few trips. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. bye. She had many heavy grocery packages. Well, she's going to have to wrestle with them on her own today. <laughs> Uh, very often when people, uh, when one of the two parties has filed for divorce, maybe I'll start there. Divorce has to start with one of the, one of the two people requesting that there be a divorce. If you, if you file a divorce, most likely you're going to need a lawyer because you're not an expert on what is the paperwork and uh, what does a filing look like and what kinds of things should go into the filing for divorce. So a lawyer will coach you and fill out the paperwork, among which there always has to be a financial statement. You have to turn in a, a statement of your personal finances, uh, your earning capacity, and on and on. That has to accompany the petition for a dissolution of the marriage. That's what it's called. It's not called a divorce. It's a dissolution of the marriage. It gets filed with a court, and then a process server shows up and gives a subpoena to the uh, other party that they are to appear in court on a certain date in order to he have a hearing on the petition to end the marriage. And uh, some people who file for uh, a divorce do not even give the courtesy of notifying the partner that the divorce filing has been done. The first way the person who's going to be divorced by the other person gets wind of it is when the process server comes and says, here are your divorce papers. You are, uh, there's a date for you to show up in court. That, that's not a very nice thing to do, but many people are very frightened about a confrontation. They're uh, scared about uh, being hated. Uh, they have all kinds of fears which prevent them from being forthcoming. And it's not uncommon. I would say, yeah, 10% of the people who separate, one of them rents an apartment secretly. And on a given day, uh, when the other person is occupied, actually starts moving belongings into the apartment and leaves a note behind, I'm divorcing you and I'm moving out. And then the process server comes sometime afterwards. That, that's the first that they've heard that a divorce has been signed. I wouldn't recommend that as the optimal way 
to go about this business, although I'm not sure there's any reasonable way <laughs> to go about it when I pause for a second. Uh, mm, okay, I have a note to myself. Once the papers are filed and the court gets involved, the court becomes a theater in which human folly and woundedness typically are enacted in a variety of ways. Driven by several things, uh, uh, a fear of, uh, if there are children, a fear of being alienated or losing a connection with the children, a fear of losing out in some kind of favorability competition with the spouse to the children, losing out in the court of public opinion about how this divorce is taking place, they, they get worried that they're in some kind of contest and that uh, there's danger in losing the contest. There are very bad consequences if, if they lose the contest. So they'll engage in desperate kinds of behavior to try to avoid losing that contest where the whole process of purpose of, of the laws of the state of California and the existence of the court is to try and diminish and get away from being in an adversarial relationship as the, the divorce has struggled to be attained. Uh, divorces are always easier if there are no children, because there are always two things that have to be in any divorce settlement. And part of what has to happen is the two people have to arrive at a settlement a set of agreements about how everything is going to be moved apart and divided up. And it's usually in many parts, what, what happens to automobiles, what happens to any property, what happens to any savings, what happens to incomes, what happens to the children, on and on and on. And the court will not allow the divorce, uh, the dissolution agreement to be granted until there is a final uh, agreed upon an effective final settlement agreement that gets filed with the court. That's the last step before a, a uh, dissolution agreement can be issued by the court. You might think of the time that the court is asked to be involved by the filing of the uh, papers requesting a dissolution until the final filing of the final agreement between the couple that is the theater in which many actions can take place on the stage of the courtroom. If you have a reasonable and working alliance still with the person you're divorcing, all of it can go on in, in interactions and conferences with the lawyers, and you never have to be in court at all. But that's not likely. Most people get upset with each other, angry with each other, wanting to punish each other, wanting justice, they want to go to court because they believe they're in the right and they want the court to so announce that they're the ones that are in the right and what they're asking for is the correct thing and they want the support of the judge, the judge will hear the case and agree that I'm right, my spouse is wrong and they want the theater to go on and they, they want to have that moment when they are proved to be right because it's very important to be right. Uh, when there's children, of course, everything is much more complicated. The law has a presumption of what should happen to the children in the case of a dissolution. That is written into California law now. The presumption is that both parents shall continue to share legal custody, it's called. And I think we lay people confuse custody and residence and visitation. Custody has nothing to do with where the children live. Custody is the power to make decisions about children. And the court says under most circumstances, it would want both parents to continue to participate in the making of whatever decisions need to be made about the children. That would be wonderful if the two could do that with any kind of peaceful thoughtfulness, but it's, it's unfortunately rare. Uh, so a related part of this is not only should custody be shared and continue to be shared, but there should be co-parenting. That has to result from custody being shared. The parents should be able to have discussions with each other, 
make decisions with each other, arrive at conclusions about what's good for the children together, and they'll do it with smiles and in a peaceful fashion, even if they're giving up being attached to each other. Uh, my favorite saying when I walk with people caught up in this process is, if parents could co-parent effectively, they probably wouldn't be getting a divorce because it means they can have arguments about contentious things, not lose their patience, be reasonable, negotiate, give and take, come to conclusions that give both parties part of what they want, but maybe not everything, and do it with smiles and without animosity and hatred. And there aren't a lot of divorcing parents who can hold that posture. We even have some people in our field, some other therapists, psychologists, who work with couples who are having contentious divorces, hoping to be able to foster and bring about co-parenting so that the process of getting the divorce loses its poisonousness and beyond the divorce itself, the continuing looking after the children until they reach maturity and go out into the world, that can be done with reasonable peacefulness too. I have an alternative proposal that I make frequently in moments like this. I don't think parents should be held to the standard of working as hard as they can to achieve co-parenting. I think a model that I call separate parenting is quite fine and just reduces a lot of visits to the court, a lot of anger, a lot of uh, hostile and poisonous exchanges. All that has to be agreed to is we are different. When the child's with me, the child may have a different bedtime. I, I'm a vegan. I'm only going to feed the child non-meat substances. I'm gonna, they're going to have a strict vegan diet. Uh, I want them uh, to learn about the Catholic religion. I know you're Jewish, but I'm going to take them to Catholic uh, services and on and on with a list of things that are absolutely anathema to the other person. And the other person can say the same thing. I know you're going to do those things, but when they're with me, they are going to do X, Y, and Z that are very different from the things you're doing. And I believe they can be flexible. They'll, they'll be exposed to two different cultures, two different sets of beliefs, two different moral standards. And they will grow up knowing that people differ about these things everywhere in the world. And they'll make their own choices about who they become. Neither one of us gets to script their choices. As a matter of fact, it might even be a strength if we're separate and different. That might be something that's good for them in the long run rather than bad for them. What's important is we're not going to fight about any of it. We're going to shut up and just be separate and different. If you could arrive at a separate parenting agreement, there are only two things that the two people ever have to confer about. One is if something is changing in the economic arrangement they have, somebody loses a career, somebody goes bankrupt, somebody comes into a huge inheritance. There's a, big economic change. I think the court gives people the right to contest and have discussions of some of that. And certainly uh, one should not keep secrets. And if you come into an air, it's a spouse should know about it. Uh, that one's protected pretty well. If uh, whatever you get that's sold in separate property after you separated, the person you separated from does not have a claim on that property. But you may have been getting spousal support from the person and now you have a big inheritance. They may be able to terminate their necessity to pay you a lot of spousal support if you suddenly have a huge other source of income that doesn't depend on their giving you the money. That may be contested in court. So yes, there may have to be financial conversations if financial circumstances change. And there have to, may have to be discussions of visitation because part of the parenting agreement uh, has to be setting up residence and visitation. Where is the child going to live with whom and on what days? And sometimes one of the parents is not available. The parents gone to the hospital, for instance, is sick. Yes, the parent who ordinarily would be turning the children over now has a dilemma. And the, the parent who's in the hospital 
maybe going to make arrangements for them and maybe have to say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to keep the children with you for this period of time until I'm healthy again. I believe when there's a change coming like that, if it's a voluntary change, like my workplace is going off on a retreat meeting and I know I'm scheduled to have the children Monday, Wednesday, and Friday next week, but I'm not gonna be in town. Would you like the right of first refusal? I'll be happy to just let the children remain with you. If not, I have responsibility. I have to find some other place to park them. I have to bring a sitter in or I have to find a relative or a friend or another family who'll take care of them. It's on me. That's, my, that's their time with me and I'm responsible for it. If you want the time, that's fine. You can have it, but if you don't want it, you are not my babysitter. You do not owe me that. You do not owe me to be there when I want you to be there. I will take responsibility for it. So those are only the only two matters that the couple needs to continue to consult about in a, in a separate parenting agreement. And there can be great peace and harmony with those because they're not constantly fighting. Too many clients that I have known continue to carry on a poisonous relationship with their spouse, even after there's the final decree of dissolution of marriage, even after they're no longer married, they're still doing a whole variety of very unpleasant and poisonous things. The largest number of them is uh, to plea for the trophy in the public opinion wars. Don't you need to know how really terrible my, now my former spouse has been, was, and now continues to be. You know what she did this week, blah, 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 blah. And you complain to the children about how terrible their other parent is. You complain to her family if you have any future relationship with them after the divorce, divorce about how terrible she's still behaving. You tell all your cohorts, uh, your friends and your family members, that bitch of a woman I was married to, look what she's pulling on me now. And you badmouth her and paint her in horrible light. So everybody will know you were really the decent and good one who wanted the marriage to succeed, that you were burdened with this impossible human being who is a nightmare. And you, you, you play to the audience over and over and over again. And you're always interacting with that person too. I don't like it that when Susie came home crying about what happened in school, you told her you were busy and couldn't talk to her for an hour. You're not gonna do that to our child. You drop whatever the fuck you're doing when your, our child is upset about something and you go talk to her right then. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're a terrible parent. And this goes on and on and on and on. And the noise never ends. <sighs> The culture we live in, though, is so invested in co-parenting that the court even recognizes courses in, in co-parenting that uh, the court will recommend the couples go and attend. It wants to force them, if it possibly can, to learn how to be co-parents. Now, I'm not going to be terribly cynical. I believe it might help. There may be a few people who can actually do that. Go take a course, see the error of their ways, and start, to start behaving differently. But to think that's going to fix a large, large number of relationships that are terribly poisonous and have been poisonous for long periods of time, that, that, that intervention is going to lead them to become better human beings and to some kind of nirvana, I think is foolish. Uh, all right, now where am I going next? Oh, yeah, a related issue, if I haven't made it clear, is that the children are like trophies. If I can get the children to care more about me, even to start saying that they want to live with me and they want to cut down on their visitation with their other parent, and they look forward with it to the day they don't have to be with that person anymore, that's an important trophy. That is proof that I'm the good person, that the other one is a terrible human being. So battling for the affection, allegiance, and goodwill of children becomes a central feature of the separated and then the divorced relationship. And that's very poisonous to the children to be put in such a 
saddle on a critter that they have to ride, bucking all over the damn place. All right, let's go back to the courtroom again. Often there will be a conversation between the two lawyers uh, once the divorce papers are filed and everybody looks at the papers. You're, if you have a lawyer, the lawyer will ask you, well, what do you think we, sh we should do now? You're about to go to an apartment. Where are your ch children going to live? Uh, your, your wife looks like she's going to need some support for you. How much are you willing to give her? Now, just know this is temporary. The court doesn't want anybody to get into dire circumstances, waiting, waiting, waiting for what be months or even years before there's a final divorce separation. Uh, the court will want there to be a temporary system in place that both people can live with while they go on arguing with each other or trying to work out what the final circumstances would be. So you start planning on a temporary separation agreement. And you, one of the sides proposes their version to the other side, and you have a back and forth for a while. And you're either moving towards each other or you're still miles apart about what even the temporary agreement should be. At that point, somebody files what, what's called an order to show cause. It's a petition to the court that the other side should show cause why the temporary agreement you're proposing is not acceptable. Uh, they have to prove that your proposal is a bad one and the judge is being asked to be the jury. Uh, you will make your proposal, the other side will rebut your proposal and say what they think is a better proposal and the judge will make a final determination and issue an order in writing from the court about what the parts of the temporary arrangement are. Now, before you ever get to have that hearing, the judge is likely to order that you see the one of the court hired mediators. The court has on staff people who try to mediate these disputes. And before you will be allowed into the courtroom, the judge will want you to have gone to mediation and want to hear a report from the mediator, what the mediator has proposed as a reasonable settlement for the two of you. So it's like you get two hearings. First, you go have a hearing with your lawyer, uh, your, your about to be former spouse, and the spouse's former lawyer in the presence of the mediator. You make your pitches to the mediator, the mediator tries to get you to move, will suggest, well, would you settle for this? Instead of that, would you be willing to move that much so you don't have to go to court and have all the legal expenses with your lawyer and all the rest of what's going to happen? Could, could we somehow bridge this gulf between the two of you? And the mediator will work hard to try and make that happen. Both sides have to agree with what the mediator comes up with and be willing to sign a signed statement, uh, which the mediator will prepare and provide to the parties. Here's what was discussed at mediation. Here is what was agreed upon would be the temporary settlement agreement. And uh, both parties have agreed, and then you will be asked to sign that, and that will be turned into the court, and the date of your hearing will be canceled. I'm very much of a favor of, of doing that kind of work in the presence of strangers. People are usually on better behavior when there are other people watching what they're saying and doing with each other. And the court has a good record about this, about 70% of OSC hearings about one thing or another are settled by the, with the mediator's help. And there doesn't have to be a burden on the court to actually provide court time and judges time to hear the matter, to call witnesses, to cross-examine witnesses and everything else that goes on in a court hearing. So I, I like this, that's good. Now, if you're very fortunate, the temporary settlement agreement will be workable up until you have a final settlement agreement that's been prepared after much more talk back and forth, investigation and, and dialogue, sometimes involving the, the attorney, sometimes just involving you and your former spouse. Uh, but please expect that it's gonna take maybe 
if you're very lucky, just several months, if you're not so lucky a year, and if you're in a terrible back and forth with a lot of bitterness and acrimony and using the court to prove one's goodness, that could go on for even as much as two years before there's a draft of a final settlement agreement. Now, it's not unlikely that during the time that the work is going forward uh, outside of the court on a final agreement, it turns out that some part of the temporary agreement is bothering somebody badly. Either a child is hating some part of it, throwing fits over and over again, that that's what has to be the visitation plan, or the money that's been allocated in the temporary agreement isn't enough. Somebody has some unusual expenses and they want that tweaked upwards because, oh, it turns out the kids need orthodontia and they're both supposed to pay half of the cost and one of the parties just doesn't have the money to pay half the cost. So it's not unlikely that somebody is going to file an OSC to get the temporary hearing, hearing modified, temporary agreement modified before the final uh, agreement is signed. And there can be several OSC hearings, uh, making ongoing modifications occasionally back and forth. Same pattern will be followed every time you have to go to mediation before you can get into court and finally you go to court. Uh, there's one set of arguments that if you can't come to agreement about, the judge is now going to involve other people. That one set of arguments is about the children. If you're having trouble and are in difficulty all the time, feeling the other parent is not parenting properly, or the, the uh, group temporary agreements being made is not really quite good for the children or the other person doesn't deserve it. Uh, I don't know why I should send them over to his house every time they go over to stay with him. He has a girlfriend and he goes over and he's with his girlfriend and he isn't even with his kids. Why am I sending his kids over there? They feel left out. They feel they're, they're not interesting to him. I think we ought to change this and either he's not allowed to be with his girlfriend when uh, my kids are over there or those days where he's gonna be with his girlfriend, I should have the right to keep them at home. There's an example of something that involves the children that's, that's is being asked to, for a change. Uh, judges are loath to interfere in the raising of or the pattern for the raising of children by themselves with their own wisdom. They'll do one of two things and maybe both of those things. Uh, they can appoint an attorney for the child. Uh, each of the parents is coming into court with an attorney. So the attorney for the uh, child is somebody who is an attorney who understands the court system and is being appointed as like a third parent. Uh, so when the parents are arguing and the, the mediation is not settled, it, the uh, judge will ask the attorney for the child or the children what he or she thinks about this, because that, that's supposed to be a dispassionate person who's representing the legal and practical interests of the child or children. And is supposed to be doing it from, from a, a posture of caring for them, not what either of the parents cares for. So the judge will listen, take very seriously the advice of, of the lawyer from the parent. <laughs> a fight can start between the two parents, of course, about who's gonna be named as the lawyer to represent the children, who's gonna have to pay the fees of that person. Because, oh, I guess I'll turn in that direction now because it's, uh, it's come to my awareness. Everybody in this game is making money by being a participant in the game. The lawyer for each of the people getting a divorce with all goodwill, and many of them are extremely decent people. They have a vested interest in there being a big war and that the war go on and on and on and on because the more the war goes on, the more billable hours they have, the more money they're gonna make from representing one of the parties. And we are human, we, we get bent by our self-interest even when we're called upon 
to resist that and simply think of the welfare of the person we're serving. It's just very hard for us to be saint-like. So same thing happens with the, when a lawyer is appointed for the child or children. That person immediately, if they have any good sense, is gonna to wanna to start interviewing people, interviewing teachers, interviewing the parents, interviewing other relatives. They're gonna to wanna to find out things that they would be interested in knowing about the child or children so they can represent their interests better. And of course, those are billable hours to do that, all that work. If the child has been in therapy, they'll want to contact the child's therapist and get a release so they can inform themselves about what's gone on in therapy and what the child's therapist is thinking about. If it gets really gnarly, and uh, having the uh, child's therapist or the child's lawyer appointed is not taking care of it, or maybe the the the, uh, the, the the judge can already smell the smell of great dissension between the two parents. So he may or she may immediately go to asking that there be a child custody evaluation if there is battles going on about where the children should be and who should have what right to do what with them when. Child custody evaluator has had is a mental health uh, professional. Or sometimes as a lawyer, there are a few lawyers who, who have changed their practices and made that their practice. And there is special training. There's a special superior court module of training that the child custody evaluators have to go through and complete the training successfully and get a certificate to be recognized by the court. And there's a list of about 25 of them in Los Angeles County, I think. And if the judge is appointing a child custody evaluator, he doesn't directly appoint anybody. He tells the parties to work out an agreement to pick somebody on the list of the 25. They have to agree which one they're gonna pick. So they run around like crazy and the lawyers run around like crazy getting gossip about previous cases that these people were child custody evaluators on what fellow lawyers think about them what other parents may be thinking about them, or do they have, do they tend to lean towards one party or another? The, the picking of the child custody evaluator is an exercise in human dynamics. And then after that, child custody evaluator absolutely wants to be very thorough. Uh, doing child custody evaluation in the mental health professions or the helping profession has the highest rate of malpractice actions brought of any, any branch of, the, of those disciplines. Uh, the, the, a child custody evaluation specialist is 20 times as likely to be sued as an ordinary psychotherapist is. Why? Because people are heavily invested in the loyalty of their children. They know what's best for their children. If they, if they don't feel like the child custody evaluation has been sufficiently uh, cognizant of things that should have paid more attention to or aligned with that parent's interest. Uh, once in a while, they'll physically attack the person in the courtroom even they get so outraged. Or they may, they may slap them with a malpractice suit after the piece is settled down. Uh, and, and they come to have to deal with the consequences of what the judge is uh, urging. Judges love that. They love the child custody evaluator to be a lightning rod so that they can just shrug and say, I'm only doing what the specialist, the professional is telling me would be good for the children. They get off the hook and they have a shield. Oh my God. Judges do not want to be blamed for the making of custody and visitation decisions. They want it to be somebody else's fault. In this case, either the attorney for the child or the child custody evaluator. Oh, there is another mechanism available to the court if uh, the parents are having trouble co-parenting and if the separate parenting agreement breaks down because it's hard to separately, separately parent 
if, for instance, one of the parents uh, thinks that the child could go to a certain private school and the other thinks it's important that the child get a, a public school education. And there's, it's pretty hard for somebody not to start fighting if those beliefs are held very, very intensely. There's no way that uh, one can be doing separate parenting and have the child in two different schools. There are no school systems that allow the child to be some days a week in one kind of school and some days a week in another to correspond with the philosophies of the two parents. One of the ways around this that will again, uh, it will support both a co-parenting agreement and uh, a separate parenting agreement is for the judge to break up areas of decision making into blocks and put one parent in charge of a particular block. Parent, the mother, for instance, gets to make all educational decisions. The father gets to make all medical decisions. The other person is simply a consultant. The other person's views have to be sought but the final decision is up to the one named by the judge to make, and the power is in that person's hand. Uh, that will work. That will keep people from having to bicker, bicker with each other frequently. I'm trying to think of other examples of. Uh, Par partialing out thing. Oh, uh, since a child, a, a, a case I was attached to was the girl, the mother was given the right to decide what extracurricular activities the child would be in and the after school hours, ballet class, uh, playing a musical instrument, uh, uh, whatever it was, the, the mother and the daughter would decide that. The father was on the hook financially for X number of dollars towards any extracurricular activities, but not beyond that. The father was exempted from having to arrange the transportation uh, to those activities. So on times when the, the, the daughter was with the father, she had to figure out how to get the kid picked up and taken from the father to whatever was the after school activity and then back to father. All this was divided up so that they would start stop fighting about it. So that was a third area of, of concern. Uh, oh. Uh, should one of the parents be open to making it obvious that the parent had an other adult in his or her life that was becoming significant to them and may even may have been on the way towards becoming a step parent. That, that, that is a thing of great dissension. And uh, parents are often back in court on in order to show cause about whether the father's girlfriend, for instance, can be in residence when the, the children are over in residence with the father, or does he have to keep her in distance for at least six months or a year or God, does he have to have an, uh, offered an engagement ring to her before <laughs> that person can meet the children? People can fight about almost anything. Now I wanna commend the court. Here's something that has been worked out that has, balance the scales in a nice way. Uh, usually up until about 20 years ago, I think the change started. Uh, the person who was the wealthiest had the advantage in getting a divorce because they could afford not to agree to anything and drag the other person back into court over and over and over again. And uh, the other person would have to try and find somebody who would volunteer pro bono services to represent them because they just didn't have the money to pay all that. Now, the court has to approve all legal fees from both parties. That's part of the final settlement agreement for the court to review what all the legal expenses were. And the court apportions those expenses to the parties based on their ability to pay. So if the, if the wife has 
five times as much annual income as the husband, she'll have to pay five sixths of all the legal expenses, including his legal expenses, as well as uh, her own in legal expenses. Uh, I like that. That makes very, very good sense to me. Also, the judge is watching over the lawyer's uh, shoulders so that they cannot come to court, claim unreasonable legal fees for the work that they've done. Hmm. All right. There can be turbulence, unpleasantness, court appearances up until the time when the final divorce settlement is executed. There are many couples, however, who can't let go. If there's any ambiguity, anything they don't like, they want to go back again to court and they'll do it over and over again until both any children have reached the age of emancipation and they can no longer squabble in court about what's to happen to the child. They use the court as an instrument for punishing the other person. And again, trying to prove that they're the good person and the other person is the evil one. Now, the, the parties are free to negotiate anything that's comfortable between the two of them, but the court has a resource uh, as they begin to try to struggle with how we're going to come apart and what the terms and conditions are going to be. The judge has in his software on his computer, and every family law attorney has the same thing. It's called the DISO Master. Uh, it, it's a software program. You can plug in what the earning capacity of the parties is, how, what kind of holdings they have, uh, what, the, what the visitation pattern is going to be, uh, what are their housing expenses at the present time, what expenses are they claiming. They can put every, every entry that has a financial implication into a DISO master, and the DISO master will spit out various things. Uh, the DISO master will spit out well, it seems to be a reasonable way to divide up the property and it'll spit out uh, what is spousal support and child support that is to be paid in this case. Uh, if, if the pa parents uh, are usually pretty much on a par with each other, $1 a year will be uh, ordered by each to pay to the other for, for child support. The court keeps open the fact that circumstances might change and the children have a right to make a claim uh, for relief on behalf of parents or for extra help on the behalf of the other if circumstances change. So nobody can waive child support and say, I, I forgive my spouse from paying any child support for the rest of my children's uh, years before maturity. They have to accept at least $1 a year. And the prospect of changing it has to be kept open. However, anybody uh, who is separated, who has been with the partner for at least a year, the person who is much worse off than the other person is entitled to some spousal support, if only to help them through readjust and to start a new life apart from the other person. You, you get uh, one year of spousal support for each year that the two people have been married, up to 12 years. If you have been married for 12 years when you separate and somebody is entitled to child support, that person is gonna get the support for the next 12 years. After that, it's lifetime. Now, I am a big enemy of lifetime spousal support. That encourages people, if there's a great disparity in their incomes, not to move on with their life. That encourages somebody not to let anybody else matter to them in such a way it might threaten a big income stream of theirs if they were to get serious with the other person. And the law has tightened up. Unless you got married, you don't lose your, your spousal support. That's the only, if you have lifetime spousal support, that's the only act that will terminate your spousal support. That's now changed. If you hold yourself out as being married, you can now be asked to waive your child support. That is, if you go to a hotel and register as husband and wife, or if you ever introduce yourself as, as an event as being married people, 
uh, whether you are or not. If you try and get married and keep it a secret, anything, any of these things will get the spousal support yang. So I encourage people who are confronted with having to pay spousal support to see if they can uh, negotiate a different kind of agreement. Anybody can voluntarily waive spousal support. You're not obligated to accept it. So I suggest they try and see, is there a number? If, if they paid a large number on the day the divorce became final, would the, would the person then waive any further spousal, spousal support going forward? And that really separates the two people in, in return for a big payout Spousal support ends voluntarily. And I like that settlement. Sets people free to follow their destiny without being contaminated by money concerns. My final comment, since it is my profession, and I've been down the road many times, is that those of us who offer help to human beings need to understand how the court functions and need a little bit of a semi-legal education of the kind I've been trying to give here because we are likely to, uh, to be, uh, the attempt is likely to be made by one or the other of the people around the, the person who is our client to yank us into court to give testimony about something something that's going to advantage one of the uh, two parties in the divorce proceeding. Opinions of the uh, parenting capabilities of somebody we may ne never even have met, or comments about the parenting capabilities of a client of our own. If the, the person thinks the client is crazy and we've been treating that client for crazy behavior and she loses her temper at the drop of a hat and I need to go testify what a nut job that person is, they will likely subpoena me. I urge anybody who is in the position of having somebody in a caring relationship with them, who now is starting to file a subpoena on them to get them uh, to give information or appear pu publicly in court, first thing to do is find, take a look at your papers. Who is your malpractice insurance carrier? And that person has a, a, a set of attorneys who will give you a consult. Please consult with your malpractice attorneys, the malpractice carriers attorney, and find out how you should respond to the petition. There are a variety of ways that might be. Uh, you might have you might ask for a release. You're not going to respond to any petition without a release of information from the person who is your client. If this person is your, uh, not your client, you may be counseled to write back. You cannot comment on anybody with whom you've not had a professional relationship. That would not be uh, the standard of care in your profession. And you're going to resist the subpoena and uh, not, not appear. Another thing might be, uh, I cannot give testimony about what I think would be a good child custody evaluation uh, outcome. I am not a registered child custody evaluator. I can give factual testimony about uh, who spends more time with the child or who has expressed a lot of concerns about their child's well being. I can give factual testimony. I cannot make recommendations about a package of what would be good custody of visitation for the child, unless the judge orders me to give my opinion. And the last thing you should be concerned about is who's paying you. Ordinarily, uh, it is the person who served you with a request that you provide something that is supposed to be paying you. And you have to differentiate two things. Are you a uh, fact witness? Are you simply going to be asked, asked facts? Like how many times did you see the client? Did the client ever say something like the following? These are all facts. If you're going to be asked for a professional opinion about the meaning of the facts, then you're what's called a precipient witness. 
there are two very, very different pay scales. If you are a fact witness, the County of Los Angeles uh, sets a fee. I think uh, it's $50 currently. If you're called to recite facts, you can't ask to be paid more than $50. And it's supposed to be given to you actually in advance of your appearing on the witness stand and parking is supposed to be paid for you. And that's it. If you are a precipient witness and you're going to be asked a lot of opinions and you're gonna be cross-examined and other witnesses may come in and try and counter your opinion, you can ask for a reasonable fee. You can, uh, you can ask for a few thousand dollars for half a day, whatever is reasonable. You, you need to got, find gossip from your peers about what they're used to asking for to appear as an expert witness in a trial like that. And also get that before you have to show up and testify. That should be your condition of appearing on the witness stand to be paid in advance. Okay, I think I'm at the end of what I was going to talk about today. I think I will have one more chapter in this book, some final observations. Um, I don't know what they're going to be. Some, <laughs> sometime between now and next week, I'll come up with some final observations about the whole topic of marriage. All right, the floor is open. Arthur, as I uh, probably uh, mentioned last week, um, I have to once again take exception with your concept of separate parenting. I think in the case of uh, a parent who lives in China and one who lives in, in Los Angeles, going to China or sending the child for um, uh, three months during the summer to live with the father who lives in China, that could probably constitute kind of like a separate parenting. But in terms of kind of like having differences of opinions and, and, and concepts of education, health, sports, activities, and support, doesn't work for kids. I've worked with many, many different kids. Oh, I understand and, that. But yeah. What is to be done about it? Because those differences exist. Remember, people are separating because they have irreconcilable differences. Well, I, I think in some ways that if, if a, a child wants to play soccer and the mother takes the, the, the child to soccer practice, if the father can attend the soccer practice, then the child's going to be happy. The child's going to be happy. I agree with that. And, and he, he, the, the father may not know anything about soccer but the fact that the yeah. father is at the soccer practice you know is thrilling for the child what happens if the father says the only time he has to practice soccer is the time i want him to be playing baseball he, he needs to go into little league after school the, then basically the 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 soccer coach is going to say you know where's jimmy jimmy needs to be at the practice well does the mother have the right to sign him up uh, to go to i, I think there has to be mutual agreement what that we're going to we're going to sign him up for agree. we're going to sign him up for soccer or we're going to sign him up for baseball what if they or, don't agree then then it's too bad for jimmy then jimmy suffers oh i know jimmy is going <clears> to <throat> suffer but does he go nowhere and sign up for? Well, I, I think that that's uh, you know. Th then then Jimmy's therapist has to really uh, uh, talk to father and say, "Listen, Jimmy loves soccer. You know, you've got to try to, and kind of like make it to his practices and support him. You know, because in some ways he really loves soccer. And even though in some ways, uh, you know, kind of like that's your day, that's his soccer practice. So you've got to go out there and support him." What if uh, Jimmy loves neither soccer or, nor baseball? And he, what he wants to do after school is he wants to become a skateboarding champion. He wants to hang out at the skateboarding camp park, park and get really adept at uh, flying on the skateboard. Then, then both mom and dad have to say, hey, listen, Jimmy loves skateboarding and we've got to support him. I and, have a mother will say, I don't want to do that. That's dangerous. He's going to hurt himself. He can go play soccer like a sensible person. I always wanted to play soccer when I was a kid, and I resented that nobody let me play soccer. 
the greater good. The greater good <laughs> is having your child be happy and, and also be supported by both parents. That it, now, now that may not happen. But, but, <laughs> that's but, assuming that, mature, yeah. thoughtful parents. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But, but that's, oh, I, that's, I that's what you shoot for. I absolutely yeah. agree. The attempt to get the parents to be thoughtful, to put their own needs and their own prejudice to one side, and to listen to the voice and needs of their child is a lovely thing. And it should be encouraged and tried. I'm just saying, what do you do when it isn't working? Well, but that's then, why I think it's better that they have nothing to do with each other than these incessant bicker bickering that they're capable of. But if one parent is saying, well, I want to have the, the child homeschooled and the other one says kind of like, I want my child to go to, uh, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, the best private school, you know, in, in, in the city, you know, because I think that he's absolutely brilliant and would really thrive there. So what do you do? How, how are you going to say, when the, is the father going to say, well, it's, it's my day. Wednesday is my day. So he can't go to school. That's he right. To go to homeschool. I actually had a family where that was going on. He was refusing. The mother was refusing to let the kid go to the private school that uh, the father had enrolled the kid in. So the, 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 the kid is going to, to miss school that day and, and, and to be out. It, you know, kind of like and miss miss uh, the lesson and, and and class and friends and homework. You well, know, that resulted in an emergency OSC. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, the, the court has to become then becomes the arbitrator. Yes. And so what, these people were bickering so much they were forced into separate parent, parenting in the way I described. The judge set up categories of decisions. And, and tried to divide up who was going to the parent that was going to have the final decision about the various categories. And the other was simply going to be a consultant. The parent who had the final decision making certainly was obligated to interview the other parent about that parent's sense of fitness of things and that parent's preferences. But then that parent had to shut up because the, the first parent had the right to mm. make the decision. Maybe then you, you split the child in half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard that story before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that stops the conflict is much better than continuing ongoing pulling at the child. I agree. And I think sometimes to get the parents to be separate from each other and to stop trying to get the other person to be a version of what they want the other person to be is the only way to stop the conflict. Not so easy to do, though, yeah. to have separateness. Yeah, I just well, I talk to clients and kind of explain that maybe they'll just have slightly different lives when they're with you and than with the other parent and yeah. email your negotiations. Don't don't talk in person or anything, even texting nice. too fast. And uh, and then and then reframe it as you know the, the, the child's getting some uh, some uh, a variety of experiences. You know different ways to live. They'll be more resilient for it. You know. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh. I assume both of you had your share of uh, couples occasionally, at least, that were found it very hard to let go and were fighting tooth and nail all the time. Still do. You, know, you, you have a, I don't have anybody like that in my practice right now, and I'm relieved. You are struggling with one or more right now. No, I, I have I have kids that I'm seeing where the the parents are, you know, uh, at opposite ends of everything. And the, the yeah. kids, uh, you know, have a, a very, very rough time. All right. I'll, I'll be insane today. I'm pleading temporary insanity. I'll, I'll revise a, a, a version of a joke about a, uh, a rabbi in a small Eastern European town. Uh, a couple of the kind we're talking about showed up in front of the rabbi. They were having hideous fights with each other about 
what the, what were the standards of conduct they wanted for their children? What were the activities their children should be pursuing? Uh, what were the friends their children should be hanging out at? They were arguing and arguing in front of the children all the time. And they thought the rabbi was a, was a wise person. They ought to take these disputes and lay them out in front of the rabbi so that the, they, they would be doing what was more holy and probably better for the children. Maybe they weren't being perfect parents, but they were arguing so much. So they went to the rabbi and uh, <laughs> they started out, uh, the wife said that her, her son had a friend uh, who, who had been caught stealing things uh, from the local store the other day and she wanted to punish him that he wasn't to be the friend with that shit kid anymore and father was insisting that the boy needed to learn from the experience that he meant well and the wife the wife went back and forth with him no that family is rotten you know that family nobody's good in that family the sooner our son has nothing to do with that family better than that. The, the, uh, while they were doing this back and forth and bringing up the baiting point, the rabbi was stroking his beard and listening. And, and uh, every once in a while, he would turn to one of them and say, that's interesting. You know, you're right. And then he would turn to the other one and say, when the other one was saying something different, that's interesting too. And you know, you're right. And they went from trouble with the kid and the kid's friend they, they went to uh, how much uh, dessert should they have? What kind of portions of dessert they should have? They were arguing about the same thing. And again, the rabbi was listening and say, that makes sense. You know, you may be right. Do the same thing with the husband when the husband was bringing up things. So this went on for an hour, bickering about six different topics that they couldn't agree upon. And, and finally, uh, they said, uh, the rabbi said, let, let me think some more about what you've been presenting to me. And come back in a week. And so they left. And the rabbi's wife had been listening uh, from another room all the time he had been there. She had been arranging flowers or doing something in the other room. And she said, my dear husband, I don't understand. The wife was saying this. And you said, you know, you're right. And then the husband would say something and contradict her and say, you know, that's really good. You're right. You just kept saying one was right and then the other was right. And the rabbi stroked his beard and said, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's all you, you can do, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's time today. I'll be back next week. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. See you. Guys. See Bye. you.